let's turn our attention to some really interesting emerging opportunities for our kidney cancer patients. We've had a, a spectacular decade of, of therapeutics, and, and it really appears that that's going to continue. Um, let's start with a conversation around uh, the clinical trial called the Cabo Sun trial. Uh, this was a trial in the frontline setting, a randomized phase two trial that compared sunitinib to cabozantinib. So kind of summarize those, those results for us and give us a sense of, as we start to talk about emerging therapies, how you think that data may play out over time. So CABOSUN is a phase two trial, like you said. It was um, done by the cooperative group here in the United States. It was a small trial. It was 150 patients randomized to either cabozantinib or sunitinib. And they did demonstrate that cabozantinib had a uh, superior progression-free survival of around 8.2 months compared to 5.6 with sunitinib. The response rate was doubled in the cabozantinib arm compared to sunitinib. So it's certainly this may be an opportunity to bring a drug on to first line if the um, data can be confirmed by uh, the independent investigators. Some of the issues with this trial is it was surprising how poorly sunitinib did, you know, because it was a little unexpected that sunitinib would only have a progression-free survival of around five months. We expect, at least in the intermediate and poor risk group, to have about a PFS, I would expect, of around eight months. So it was a little surprising. There were some differences in dosing, like we have been talking about earlier, most of us do sunitinib as two weeks on, one week off. In this trial, sunitinib was given as four weeks on, two weeks off. So there may be some dosing issues as to why uh, sunitinib didn't do as well. But nonetheless, I think cabozantinib um, did remarkably well in the Meteor trial. We know that it met uh, PFS, OS, and objective response rate. So if truly this is an opportunity, it might be a great uh, move to get this drug in the front line, especially for some patients um, such as bone mets, which has been a very challenging group to take care of. This would be a great option to have in the front line. We're starting to see um, changes in our frontline thinking. Uh, Cabo Sun's an example which was unexpected where we saw a next generation TKI outperforming an older generation TKI. At the ASCO meetings and, 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 meeting, and, and, and at ASCO GU, we've started to see combinations of IOs and IO or IOs and targeted therapy. Um, how do you think about that from the perspective of safety, efficacy, some of the things that you're seeing in, in early phase one and phase two trials that are leading to the pivotal trials that are taking place? Where, where are you with that? So there's certainly been a lot of excitement to take uh, a treatment to the next level. We have 10 years of targeted therapy um, that have been effective in improving outcomes for uh, patients across the board. Then the arrival of immuno-oncology, which created a lot of excitement, and then the natural next step of bringing the two together. So we're combining the old and the new with uh, uh, many trials now in early phase development, but uh, a total of five trials now in the phase three setting already, frontline combining either immunotherapy with immunotherapy or immunotherapy with VEGF-directed uh, therapies. And the rationale for that, for one, is because just you know, trying to do more and being more aggressive, pushing on the gas pedal here. Um, but secondly, there, there is preclinical rationale for um, all of these combinations to some extent in that we have data that suggests that the targeted agents that are not therapy, uh, immunotherapies uh, can modulate the immune microenvironment in some way that might be favorable in terms of response to checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Getting back at your question, efficacy and tolerance are obviously the questions at hand. So we're being more aggressive to show more effective therapies, um, but at the same time, you know, giving two medications that um, uh, jointly brings, uh, brings about greater um, chance for toxicity. And we have some uh, combinations that actually have not made it um, past uh, you know, the um, phase one stage. Uh, I was an investigator on a clinical trial that actually uh, was meant to investigate a combination of a TKI, pazolpinib, with uh, pembrolizumab, a PD-1 inhibitor, 
and was designed to have a phase one portion to then go into a big randomized segment and never did so because the toxicity proved uh, um, unmanageable. There were a, a high grade of um, uh, hepatic toxic, uh, toxic events uh, in the first cohorts uh, that we treated. Uh, and uh, it wasn't for a lack of trying. We actually changed the design of the trial around to uh, have a sequence approach where patients would get a lead-in of the TKI first and hope that whatever low-grade inflammation around the liver may actually subside, and then adding the IO drug only in those patients who are tolerating the TKI well. And even for that, and that is data that is being presented at ASCO 2017, uh, we found that uh, there was a high grade um, of dose-limiting toxicities in patients once they went on the combination. Not hepatic, but other toxicities uh, ensued. So this is one example where a combination uh, you know, um, was not more um, um, effective in terms of its development because it proved too toxic. But we have other combinations that have proven uh, quite manageable and that have made it from the first into uh, phase one into the uh, phase two and phase three space, some of which even skipped phase two altogether. They went straight from phase one to phase three because the feeling was that they were sent, you know, that they were manageable and so effective that they were you know, worth being tested um, in, a, in a registration trial.